So we're here at the University of Roehampton with Pete Kemp, who's Senior Lecturer in Computing Education, a PhD student here, a Teach First Ambassador. He was one of the contributors to the English National Curriculum in Computing and runs this amazing 3D animation summer school called 3D AMI. Pete, it's great to be here with you. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. So the National Curriculum talks about equipping pupils with computational thinking and creativity. How should schools best go about promoting creativity in computing lessons? The first step that a school should take is to really think about what is creativity for their students. Ken Robinson defines creativity as creating original ideas that have value. And a school should really think about what is this value that these original ideas will have for their students. And you might look at creativity in two ways. Creativity with a big C and creativity with a little c. So creativity with a big C is creativity which is going to go and change the world in some way. So if we talk about Einstein and we talk about Picasso, we're talking about creativity with a big C. Now, it's sadly unlikely that many of your students would be exhibiting creativity with a big C. So we have to look at creativity with a little c. And creativity with a little c uh, can be summed up as in as children flourishing in their environment. So creativity with a little c for your students might be teaching them how to program so they can then look at getting a job in the future or they can learn how to express themselves through digital art. And creativity with a little c can be taught suddenly in your lessons and you should be teaching your students to get step by step towards creativity with a big c. So the steps that you're taking in the classroom are giving the students the mastery and giving students the links to the individuals which will help them actually, in the future, start to have creativity with a big C. And this isn't to say that some of your students might not be using creativity with a big C. There are many examples over the last couple of years of students in British schools and worldwide doing things which really impact the world. So setting up apps which make lots of money, um, but also setting up apps that help to change people's lives. And you need to keep an eye on that because it's very unlikely, sadly, that a student would be coming up with a mathematical theory when they're at secondary school, which is creativity with a big C. But coming up with a piece of computer programming, which is creativity with a big C in secondary school, is perfectly possible. Is this something which schools should build into their scheme of work? Can you have lessons in which you teach creativity? What practically ought a school to do? So I think that we can break down creativity into two components. We have the field and we have the domain. And the domain is the area that most people are familiar with. It's the, uh, the language that we need to understand for computer programming. It's also the skills and the tools that we need to stay safe online and how to use computers effectively. So you can get your students to master the domain that you're studying, the comput computing domain that they're studying. But also creativity needs to be linking domains together. So teaching in a cross-curricular way is a really important way of encouraging creativity um, in school. But there's another area, which is the field, which isn't so often covered in secondary schools. And the field involves the individuals, organisations, that actually are the gatekeepers to being successful in a certain domain. So if we're looking at uh, the field for computing, we're looking at maybe getting students involved with online communities, or getting students involved with competitions, so their work can be recognised and what they're doing could help to actually change the domain, to sort of change some of the, the knowledge around computing in a worldwide way. So this is about not merely mastering content, but participating in communities of practice. Absolutely. And you might find that some of your students in your school are really, really good. And uh, one of the ways that I talk to my PTC trainees is to talk about, uh, you might find a student who's a very big fish in your relatively small school pond. And showing them a world outside your school, showing them that they're very good at programming, we know that already, but there's some way to go before they become the absolute worldwide best, is really important. And that involves linking them with online communities and linking them with other individuals who are interested in the area that they're interested in. And the web makes this possible in a way which would have been unimaginable in schools 20 or 30 years ago. 
Absolutely. And you will probably find that your students are already demonstrating their, their prowess with computing by um, being on websites such as YouTube or posting their work on DeviantArt, um, and they might even be getting involved with GitHub. Um, so finding out what your students are currently doing and seeing how you can actually assist them with accessing this field is really important for their creativity. And how does 3D animation relate to computer science education? So it's very hard to watch a movie or TV show at the moment which doesn't involve some form of 3D manipulation, some 3D animation or post-processing. And the tools used to edit these films and to make these films involve a lot of really hardcore computer science. So we have lots of computer programming in there, but also lots of other computational um, thinking skills as well. Now, we're not suggesting that your students should go out and write their own 3D animation tools, which is perfectly possible for many of them. But you might find that if you're doing something like the A-level, that there's some really nice opportunities there to get students programming their own 3D tools using something like Blender. So they can be programming their own plugins and they can be using that plugin to do something really cool, but at the same time um, getting the evidence together for an A-level. Now, another thing here is when we talk about teaching computing in schools um, or computer science, we have this basis of computational thinking. And 3D animation uh, is a perfect way that students can start to express their computational thinking. So if we take computational thinking um, using a very simple definition to be decomposition, pattern recognition, abstraction and algorithms. When you're making a film, you're decomposing a film into its individual shots. And each shot, you're decomposing that shot into the items that are in that shot. If you're looking for pattern recognition, well, of course, you might find that uh, a car in one shot is also a car in another shot. Or you're looking that a car in this shot here, which is blue, is the same car in another shot, but we can colour that in brown. So we have a pattern recognition system there as well. If we're looking at abstraction, well, if you're modelling something quite complex in a scene, you probably don't need to model the back of it. So if you're modelling some shops, you don't need to model the back of the shops, just the front of the shops. And if you're looking at, say, low poly art, well, we're looking there at um, abstraction. So how do you represent something like a, like a cow, but with a very low number of polygons? So that's, you know, that's a really good example of abstraction. And when we look at algorithms, we're looking for um, the step-by-step step -step process of, of putting your animations together and how you're going to, to make that work. Now, all of these things are really, really essential to 3D animation. And I, I would argue that some parts of 3D animation are, are better at teaching computational thinking than programming, say. So if you want to look at modular design of projects, you could get a group of students, each of them making a different asset for a shot, and then just linking them all together. And teaching modular design, I would say in 3D animation, is easier than if you were trying to do it with computer programming. Because to do modular design and computer programming might take a lot of programming before you get to actually using modules and functions and procedures. You see something on screen that seems a much more concrete experience of decomposition or modular design than, than writing computer code would be. And it's also a little bit more forgiving. So if you are creating, say, I'm, I'm going to make a house, you're going to make a tree, um, and your tree's not very good, Miles, well, that's okay, because the shot will still work. It's just that your tree will look a bit rough, and okay, you can keep iterating and improving that. Um, while in computer programming, if your module that you were writing didn't work, well, none of the code would work. It just would, it would completely break. So, Pete, how does Blender work? I'm less concerned about user interface than what's actually happening inside the machine. What are the computational abstractions involved in 3D animation? Sure. So, this here is the rough Blender interface. And just to give you an analogy, it's a bit like a stage if you were putting on a drama play at school. And you have, in the stage, you have your objects, you also have your lighting. So you can have multiple areas of lighting, you can set up your lighting for the scene to look correct, and you also have over here um, your camera. So you can have multiple cameras or move them around. Now, I've got a Blender setup at the moment to use something called ray tracing. And what ray tracing does is it looks at all the light sources and it shoots out little beams of light and then sees where they bounce around and reflect. So if I'm looking at this space here, I can see that my light is kind of above and to the right, or it looks to be above and to the right of this object in the centre. 
And if I scroll around a little bit, I can see, okay, yes, the light is slightly above and to the right of this cube. And I have my camera looking straight on the cube. So what we would expect is we would expect little rays of light to go down, to bounce off this surface, and then to go into the camera. So it's much like how our eyes work, actually. Blender is replicating how our eyes work, where the little light is the sun, objects are the things that we interact with, and over here the camera are our eyes. So if I go and press render, which is going to take a picture of this to see what it would look like, um, you will see it slowly builds up the picture, and yes, the, the light is at the top right, so it's bouncing um, down off the surface, the top surface, and into the camera. And the surface which is furthest away and behind the rest of the scene is going to be darker because the light's not reaching that. And this is, there isn't actually light bouncing off anything. This is all done mathematically with vectors and coordinates in three-dimensional space. Absolutely. This is a, this is a complete three-dimensional system. And everything is modelled modeled in three dimensions and the light rays are all simulated. And um, if you're doing this with your students, you might find that sometimes the pictures are a bit grainy because we haven't got enough light rays. And to render each light ray takes a lot of processing power. So uh, if you're talking about some of the Hollywood movies, to render one shot in there might take a, a 24 hours, say, just to do one frame. And if you've got 24 frames a second, it would take 24 days to do one second of animation of the things that you're seeing at the cinema. My guess is that one of the challenges here is you're looking at things on a two-dimensional screen, you're using a mouse on a two-dimensional surface to manipulate objects, but all the time you're actually working in a representation of a three-dimensional reality. Is this something which young people find difficult to master? This is one of the first problems that a student new to this program might meet. That you're completely right, it's a, it's a 2D representation of 3D space. And it does take a bit of getting used to, because students are coming from predominantly 2D experiences with graphics editing programs and, and layers and things like that. So one of the ways to introduce this is just to remind them that it's a bit like playing a computer game. You can, you can rotate, you can zoom in and out, um, a bit like you might be if you were building a city in, in some sort of computer game system. If a school wanted to include 3D animation in its computing curriculum, what would you recommend? How should it go about that? Well, we're currently developing a six-week scheme of work to teach computational thinking through 3D animation um, using some funding that we got from the Google CS, CS for High School project. And what we aim to do with that is to teach the fundamentals of computational thinking across six weeks with all the slides and resources that you'd need. Um, we're working at the moment, it's not currently around, but if a school would want to implement this straight away, well there's, there's nothing to stop them implementing an after school club. And actually we have created a three hour introductory session for this with accompanying videos and a little tutorial workbook. One of the things that a school might find difficult if they were to be teaching this for the first time is around the interface. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get students focused on the very basics of modelling just to get them started and then they can start exploring further. And the basics of modelling for Blender involve a couple of tools which are down here. And we have the arrows which allow us just to move things around. And we can move around the cameras or the lighting or the objects in whichever way we want. And that's going to help us with animation a bit later as well. We've also got the Grow and the Shrink tool, which allows us to, uh, to stretch and um, shrink things in and get things to the right size that we want them to be. Uh, and we also have a Rotate tool here as well, which allows me to, um, to rotate things on different axes. So I could rotate on the x-axis, for example, like that. Um, and with all those tools, you can pretty much get any sort of animation or model that you, that you want to. If you're a bit fed up with your very basic cube, we would recommend that you start just using some very simple editing tools as well. So if we go down here to edit mode, you can see that I can select a face and I can extrude this, which means to add other cubes onto the side of it and start to build some really complicated shapes. And then going back to my, um, sorry, going back to select the vertex tool, I can start to move things around as well and start to model some very complex shapes which obviously look a bit more um, exciting than a cube. I'm sure there are a large number of 3D animation toolkits out there. Why did you choose Blender for this project? There are some excellent tools out there and uh, a lot of them are now free for schools to use and I would certainly recommend that you go and explore them. 
The reason that we've chosen Blender is that Blender runs on some very, very simple hardware. So if you're in a school that hasn't got the latest hardware or graphics cards, Blender will work on that as well. And if you can't get your technicians to install it on your network, um, in time you can actually run it off of your USB stick as well. And I don't believe that these two features are available with other programs either. And, and finally on that, uh, on that front, the exciting thing with Blender is because it's open source and free, we have had students coming through our system and actually making money by selling their work online. And I don't believe the, the other software products will allow students at the age of 16, 17 to do that. And of course you can install it on your school network and your students can install it on their home machines without worrying about meeting license terms and conditions. Absolutely, and if they struggle to get a computer at home they might even be able to take a USB to a library and to continue doing some work there as well. That brings us nicely on to computing education and social inclusion, which I know is something that you're researching at the moment. What are your initial findings? If you look at the new GCSE in computing, you're seeing grammar schools making up a disproportionately large percentage of schools entering their students into this qualification. And this is a bit worrying. So for the first batch of students going through the GCSE, you were seeing 7% of grammar schools students taking it and 1% of secondary modern schools taking it. And this is really worrying. Now the numbers have evened out somewhat in the last year, but it will be interesting to see where they settle. And we also need to find out what are the entry requirements for this new qualification? Because we've heard many schools, anecdotally at the moment, but many schools saying that you have to get a certain grade in your SATs or a certain predicted grade in maths for your GCSE. And this will disproportionately affect students from poorer backgrounds. And how should schools then best ensure that none of their pupils are disadvantaged because of their home background? when it comes to accessing, being involved with, being included in the curriculum that the school offers? So I think schools need to really think about the resources that they're using in the classroom. And if it's, they're using a tool in the classroom which isn't available at home, they need to really think about what is the benefit of using that particular tool. So if, they, if they're using, for example, a programming language which only works on one set of uh, operate, on one operating system, well they need to think about, okay, what are the open source alternatives to that? And many of the students might have a computer at home, but they might not have access to that computer at home. Um, or they might go home and find out the night they've got to do their homework, somebody else is on the computer. So providing the opportunity for students to, uh, to come in at break times or after school, computing clubs is really, really essential. And we were talking a bit earlier about the, the field and how, how important this is for creativity. And trying to give students the opportunity from poorer backgrounds to start accessing, talking to the people involved with, with the field, with the, uh, with the computing field nationally. So taking them on trips and really helping them talk to the people who might be able to change their lives or inspire them. Broadening their horizons, providing encouragement and motivation. Absolutely. Sounds amazing. Thank you.